Welcome to this Roads Australia policy webinar. This one is on circular economy and proudly supported by Oricom. My name is Royce Christie. I am the Director of Policy for Roads Australia. Historically, roads have a lot of circularity with them as asphalt is often dug up and reused. But as an industry, we need to do more with the waste we generate and with the waste of others. In the sustainability challenge, organisations and businesses are at various points of the journey, but along with the efforts to decarbonise our energy sources, the trend behind this effort appears unstoppable. Work is continuing to advance sustainable transport infrastructure construction and operations, even while the sector faces significant pressure from labour shortages and cost increases. No matter where you are on this journey, whether you're just starting to discuss the use of novel materials or have them as part of your internal standards, I hope you learn something new from our speakers today that you can then take and implement where you work. I'll now hand over to Jody Bricout, Bricout, sorry about that, Jody, uh, to moderate this session. Thank you, Jody. Great work, Joyce. Hi, everyone. My name is Jody Bricout. Um, I lead Oricon's dedicated circular economy team. We help clients uh, thrive in a resource and climate constrained world through designing out waste, keeping assets and resources at their highest value, and also regenerating nature. Uh, I'm also on the board of Circular Australia and member of the Victorian Government's Circular Economy Innovation Advisory Committee. So it's a real delight to be able to co host today this session uh, with Roads Australia. Uh, this sustainability stream webinar looking at the latest developments in the transport infrastructure industry shift to a circular economy here in Australia. So we all know the industry has been using recycled products for decades and we're now aiming to move from this to a circular economy. Um, I've often been known to tease the roads industries a little bit for thinking about recycle like horizontal landfills in the roads and we're really moving past that now to how can we create higher value products using recycled materials. RA has been using it this looking at this issue and working directly with government and industry for the last few years. Notably they released a report in 2022 on the journey to net zero inspiring climate action in the Australian transport sector. Over the next hour We'll all hear from industry and government on what they're doing to use recycled materials and create sustainable supply chains for our roads. And you'll get a chance to ask questions to them using the Q&A function on your screen. Please use this function. It's at the bottom of your screen and not the chat function during the webinar. I'll be the facilitating, introducing our speakers. They'll each deliver a 10 minute address, followed both by five minutes of discussion and Q&A. Actually, we changed that. We're going to have all the discussion Q&A after because they're a wonderful panel and they bounce really nicely off of each other. So if you can hold your questions till the end of the three speakers, that would be wonderful. And now I'll introduce all three of them before we hear specifically from Alexis Davidson, who is not principal. So Alexis oversees the delivery of business cases for projects and leads the land planning and environment and engineering teams at MRPV. Inspired by the challenge to build sustainable transport infrastructure, Alexis was instrumental in establishing the ecologic initiative and recycled first policy in Victoria. Ecologic, you'll all know them, they aim to participate and optimise the use of recycled and reused materials on Victorian infrastructure projects, change the approach to technical standards and specifications and build market capacity and capability. Also from Melbourne is Steve Morris, Head of Circular Economy at Close the Loop. Steve founded Close the Loop, which is now part of the ASX listed company Close the Loop Group, and his role in the new group is Head of Circular Economy. He's a pioneer of the circular economy systems thinking, an inventor of Ewood, Tonoplast and two other recycling technologies for complex waste streams. Close the Loop was a finalist in the Circulars Awards by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in 2019 and a recipient of one of the Australian Circular Economy Awards in 2022. Finally, we have Sarah Rose Pogson, who's Unit Head of Circular Economy Markets at the New South Wales Office of Energy and Climate Change. Sarah Rose worked with the New South Wales EPA before shifting across to the OECC. She's a civil engineer by education. She has extensive experience in the recycling and circular economy sector from both the consultant and government perspective. She now oversees the New South Wales government's commitment for government departments to pre preference recycled content in all of their purchasing beyond transport infrastructure. So first up with you, Alexis, um, for your presentation on how MRPV is progressing sustainable supply chains in Victoria. Thanks, Jodie. Um, and thanks, Chloe, for driving the slides. 
Um, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about Ecologic and specifically the Recycled First Policy and what we're doing in Victoria. So our vision um, at Ecologic is to utilise the unprecedented, um, you know, uh, investment in infrastructure um, to, to really become the world leaders in the use of recycled and reused materials. Um, Chloe, we didn't practice this. Do you want me to say next slide when I want you to move on or? Yes, please, Alexis, thank you. So next slide, please, Chloe. Um, yeah, as I said, the, our, our, our vision is to become, you know, recognised as a world leader in the sustainable use of recycled and reused materials. Um, we established the program in 2019, um, you know, uh, we're, we're sort of working across uh, the big build. So we work across rail and road projects in Victoria. Next. We have three sort of key focus areas. Um, the Recycled First policy is probably the most, um, or, the, or the sort of the one that's having a, a massive impact. But alongside that, we're sort of, uh, we've got a focus on technical leadership um, and, and developing those supply chains that Jodie talked about in the intro. Um, next slide. So the Recycled First Policy is a really key part of the program. Um, its objectives are essentially to drive the demand for products. Um, we want to encourage innovation um, in transport infrastructure. Um, we, we found when we started on this process, we didn't really have a good comprehensive data set. So we didn't actually know what was happening and what wasn't happening and where the recycled materials were in the network. So having uh, a policy that requires reporting um, is giving us a really rich data set um, you know, to spark um, the thinking on where to focus our efforts next. Um, we're obviously supporting sustainable outcomes for, for infrastructure projects. And one of the key, um, you know, targets in the Recycling Victoria, a new economy, which is the Victorian government's circular economy policy or strategy. Um, one of their key targets is the diversion of waste from landfill. So we really see ourselves in transport infrastructure as doing a lot of that heavy lifting in creating that demand um, in, in what we build. Next. The policy is very, very simple. It only has two requirements. We're asking our contractors to optimise the use of recycled material. Um, we have workshops with them at the start of a project. Once they commit to using those materials, we will put those commitments in their contract and hold them to it and ask for reports frequently throughout the delivery of the project. It, very deliberately, we chose the word optimise because we didn't want to see any perverse outcomes from transport costs or, um, you know, we didn't want people driving materials across the state because they weren't available locally. So we very deliberately said optimise. Um, we want people to do as much as they possibly can in the geography where they are. Um, and, and with what's available to them with, you know, we've got budgets and, and schedules and stuff to keep with infrastructure delivery. So we do have to be mindful that we don't want, you know, recycled materials at the expense of something else. Um, and reporting on the materials and the volumes used will give us that rich data set. When we work with our contractors to get recycled first plans, we say, well, if you're not using it, why not? Is it not available? Is it too expensive? Did you not know where to find it? So we've got this, you know, information that we can then work from government to remove some of those barriers that may or may not be real. Next. So the technical leadership is a really important aspect of the success of the policy implementation. Um, we've created a lot of materials, um, templates, information guides. Um, you know, we've got a map of all of our Victorian suppliers. We've created a demand model that sort of indicates to the market what's coming. Um, we've got visual guides. Um, we've got um, lots of tools and information. The, the policy, we didn't want to just write the policy and throw it out there and hope for the best. Um, we wanted to support our project teams to do better. Um, and so education and awareness has been really critical. Um, next. So this is um, just a snapshot of the demand model. So you can, you know, look at any material, you can look at any application, you can see where we have projects, um, you know, in the big build horizon, four year horizon, um, and, and really trying to demonstrate that if there is a product out there, 
uh, the big bill probably needs it at some point in the next four years. So this is sort of creating that sort of certainty for the supply chain. And then if we go to the next slide, we've also created a supply map. So, you know, whatever you're looking for, you can find out who's supplying it where in Victoria. And, you know, these, these sort of tools and education are really part of us educating um, our project teams, but also our contractors on, on where to find what they're looking for. Um, next slide. So these, these are just some of the interesting things that we've got, um, you know, emerging. Um, we've got these eco bollards. They take bollards from um, construction sites. Bollards, I think, have a life of about a year before they sort of get hit by too many trucks and they're not useful anymore. So these guys are collecting those um, and, and making new ones. Um, you know, it's an NDIS supported workplace. Um, it's, it's providing regional jobs. It's, it's a really positive news story. The noise walls that um, were mentioned in the intro, something that I'm personally quite proud of um, uh, in the bottom left there. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of work with plastic railway sleepers as a, a new and emerging product. And, you know, that, that sort of has the potential to be a massive sort of, you know, there's 12 million sleepers on the Victorian network. I wouldn't ha hesitate to guess how many are on the Australian network, but if we can get a sleeper that's, you know, suitable for main use, main line, high speed use, um, that's a massive sink fund for plastic, particularly. Um, EMESH is another really nice story that's, you know, ticking sort of social and uh, regional, um, you know, benefits. Um, this is a 100% recycled plastic. It replaces the steel reinforcement in the concrete, it makes the concrete quite a lot easier to recycle at the end of its life. Um, and it's almost sort of standard in shared use paths and non-structural concrete in our projects. And the recycled drainage pipes, um, you know, we're working with the Department of Transport on getting those proof for use everywhere, but they're really positive news story with post-consumer plastic um, and, are, and are quite a mix. Um, so next. Along the way, um, we, we know some of the barriers a lot of the barriers that people were citing to us were sort of perceived um, and we've been working to understand what's real and what's not. Um, application in the rail sector has been quite a challenge. There's a lot of safety critical infrastructure that we do have to be mindful of and the testing requirements and the type approvals can be a little bit more rigorous. Um, product availability in regional areas is also something that we're cognizant of at um, major road projects, we're building projects um, across the Murray, we're in Gippsland, you know, we're in Western Victoria. Um, not everything's available everywhere. Um, and so we're really trying to work on how do we support those regional areas to be a bit more circular and use what's locally available um, uh, so that we're not, like I said earlier, having those perverse outcomes of people, you know, trucking stuff across the state just to use a recycled material. Um, so, you know, we're working hard with our contractors and with our suppliers um, and, and really sort of breaking down those barriers. Next. Uh, the impact so far. So obviously the actual use of the material will lag behind the commitment, but the recycled first commitments just keep on going up and up. Um, the, you know, the, what we're finding is that what people, what co our contractors are committing to is actually translating into real um, impacts. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more plastic in various parts of our infrastructure. Um, it's become a lot more intentional and less ad hoc. Um, and the policy has really been the catalyst for that because, um, you know, it, it, it is a, a requirement in our contracts for all, all major transport infrastructure. Um, we also have in some of our contract models some incentives. So at MRPV, we have a program delivery approach where there's a performance pool that's available if you exceed um, your, your KPIs um, and, and we have 15% of our performance pool attached to sustainability initiatives, including the recycled first commitments. So there's financial incentives uh, as well. Um, and the next slide's my last slide and it's a shameless plug for our conference in September later this year. Hope to see you all there. Thank you. Nothing like a shameless plug, Alexis. I was certainly <laughs> look forward to being there. Um, so everyone, hold your questions, pop them in the Q and A, write them down. I've got a, a page covered in notes already. Um, next up, Steve Morris from Closer Loop to talk about his story across Australia. Thanks, Steve.
Thank you, Jody, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a case study today, a, a case study of a um, an Australian product uh, uh, with the great help of Ecologic. So, Chloe, if we go straight into it, please. Uh, Close the Loop is a, is a fairly uh, well-known uh, brand, well-known Australian company. Um, started in Melbourne 23 years ago. Um, divisions now, wholly owned divisions in Kentucky and the USA and Belgium and Europe. But more recently, we have merged with the OF Packaging Group to create a circular uh, packaging group under the name Close the Loop Group. Um, but we are still famous uh, for being now the world's largest collector and recycler of imaging supplies. Now, the reason I raise that is because the polymers that arise from imaging supplies, including toner powder, um, are, are suited to our Tonerplast product for roads. So let's go into that, please, Chloe. Um, let's keep skipping through. These are some of the awards we've won, nicely summed up by Jody. thanks, uh, at, right at the start. Um, uh, many of you uh, will be familiar with the three pillars of circularity, um, each having their, their um, footprint more heavily in one area than the other as a general rule. And for us, it's certainly the, the middle pillar of circularity that we focus on, which is keeping products and materials in use for longer. The left-hand uh, bottom image is uh, soft plastics. Um, happy to take questions on that we, we were, um, before the fail, failing of uh, Red Cycle, sadly, the largest user of that mixed and contaminated uh, material from the Red Cycle program. Waste toner powder out of the uh, imaging supplies is a big one for us, and also now cosmetics recycling product stewardship programs. Next, please, Chloe. Tonoplast. Now, Tonoplast is a 10-year overnight success. You know, it's... It's really amazing the amount of effort and, and background work that's gone into this, the R&D. It all started actually with a, with a guy in America who um, decided to trial, he was a professor, and he decided to trial the use of toner powder um, as a bitumen extender um, and laid several roads in Texas. Now, when I learned about it, that whole project had been abandoned because of the dangers associated with the dust, the toner powder dust um, being added to an asphalt plant at the side of a road. However, I decided to survey those sections anyway, and there were three roads in Texas, and they all proved uh, very impressive with uh, uh, excellent deformation resistance and resisting resistance to cracking. So we decided to bring that knowledge back to Australia with Closer Loop and really uh, knuckle down on it. Um, toner Pave was the first version, and then Toner Plast, which blended mixed toner powder, mixed soft plastics, and recycled oil to make a homogenous blend called Toner Plast. And Toner Plast um, is added at the asphalt plant, and uh, uh, the, some of the benefits of Toner Plast can be seen there. Image on the bottom right is uh, the M80 freeway upgrade in Melbourne which we're very proud to uh, have uh, finally um, been able to supply a state road. And that's largely thanks to um, the help of Ecologic and if you like the progressive thinking of the Victorian Department of Transport, uh, almost 500 tonnes of tonoplast uh, went into that one section uh, between Sydney Road and Edgars Road alone. And uh, we're now uh, looking for bigger and better things. By the way, I must, uh, I must state that we had a, a very big fire here um, almost 12 months ago. And uh, that's why Tonoplast hasn't been uh, marketed uh, aggressively lately, but we are rebuilding rapidly and building bigger. Um, we'll have five times the production capacity um, when we recommission a brand new line, brand new Australian IP uh, in December. Next one, Chloe, please. So, so what happens uh, downstream is, is, is the key. Um, and what happens downstream means end products. When we're talking about circularity and the much talked about um, soft plastics challenges, um, that material that's being unloaded in that first image on the left-hand side there is red cycle material. And we used to call that, we used to call it, sadly, the mongrel mix. And it's the mongrel mix because it is so heavily mixed and contaminated how all of these 
different pieces of packaging uh, got the return to store labeling on it is another is another question that we can deal with another time but uh, just to tell you that there are laminates in there there's metallized films there are high melt plastics low melt plastics and everything in between but uh, what close the loop has been able to do is develop some technology to effectively homogenize that material produce an engineered asphalt additive that dramatically improves the performance and longevity of the of the asphalt asset um, we also make from the same types of material the rflex product which today uh, is used in um, shopping trolleys and other injection molding applications. That shopping trolley pictured there is a Coles shopping trolley um, in use right now. Next one, please, Chloe. I'm going to push through fairly quickly. Um, this is another flow chart type model. So let's push straight ahead, please. Now, this is the technology uh, Australian IP, as I mentioned, invented by a Victorian farmer, would you believe, and um, uh, commercialized by. Uh, some uh, entrepreneurs who we've introduced to our engineering company that we've been working with for over 20 years. So it's going to be made in Australia. It is being made right now. And it will handle uh, 5,000 tonnes per year of these uh, waste plastics and produce very high value products like our Tonoplast Asphalt Additive. A bit more on the next one, please, Chloe. Um, to Alexis' point, uh, it is all about, uh, the circular economy is all about localising solutions. Um, and we are on that bandwagon as well. Uh, right now, though, because there's only one Tonoplast manufacturing site in the country, uh, it's a $4 million capital, capital investment, by the way, um, we are shipping to all parts of Australia from Melbourne until we build a substantial market. Um, a thousand tonnes we did the year before the, tire, uh, before the fire, so that's a fairly substantial market. Um, our next stop is Adelaide, um, punching above their weight uh, there, Jody, and, you know, really uh, a, a very big user and buyer of uh, Totoplast uh, councils in Adelaide. Uh, we want to work with state roads in Adelaide as well as New, uh, then New South Wales and Queensland, and uh, we have demand uh, from as far away as Perth and, and Darwin as well. So creating local jobs where the waste is generated with local solutions is, is what we're all about. Next one, please, Chloe. Now, this is a really interesting thing. Um, it, it, selling any product of recycled content is is a challenge because of the stigma attached to recyclability, which is diminishing over time, I, I grant you that. But unless, what we found anyway, unless Tonoplast performs better and we can sell it on its performance criteria, it doesn't matter that it's recycled or it doesn't even matter um, that we're using a very complex waste stream to, to make this uh, high value product. So the material circularity indicator, which was developed originally by the Alan MacArthur Foundation, is our choice right now um, as, a, uh, as a tool for gaining points from the Infrastructure Sustainability Council for uh, not only the big build, but other um, council and major road projects. So under the uh, V2.1 of ISC, um, the innovation uh, section, we are uh, working with ThinkStep to uh, model a road, including Tonoplast uh, versus a control section that doesn't have Tonoplast. And it's a Reconifelt road that we're modeling in partnership with our friends at Downer, who have been uh, you know, passionate partners of ours uh, all the way through. Um, we do supply any asphalt company, but uh, we've collaborated very closely with Downer, and we're gonna continue our collaboration to develop this material circularity indicator. Early work suggests that we're gonna get about a 25% improvement in materials circularity. More about that in Q&A. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, one last one. Um, circular contracts, uh, very proudly recently signed a contract with City of Greater Bendigo. If there's any local government people here, this is interesting because Bendigo is uh, closing its landfill. We're now diverting soft plastics from the landfill um, in Bendigo, and Bendigo has signed on the dotted line to take back uh, an equal amount of Tonoplast for local roads. Um, close the loop, we're not interested in just being the back end for anybody. Um, we're interested in circular agreements where um, we're partner with our supply chain right the way through. Um, happy to talk about that as well. And that's me, I think, Chloe. I know I've um, probably gone a little beyond, sorry. Jody. No, that's great, Steve. And, and you've seeded lots of questions, so that's really good work. 
Um, everyone, please do keep those questions coming. And some people have been adding their organisation to the question name. That's really helpful. So we can um, have a bit of background as well. So please do keep that coming. Um, I loved that story of the mongrel mix, Steve, because I love to think of the resource recovery industry in Australia as really being the heroes of the linear economy and that we sort of catch what the linear economy spits out at us that's not really in a great place to be able to stuck back in our economy. So well done on getting that mongrel mix to being something high value and useful um, for this industry. Next up and last up, we've got Sarah Rose Pogson at um, the OECC to hear about the steps that they're taking on the sustainable supply chains. Take it away, Sarah. Sarah Rose. Thanks. Thanks, Jody, And hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm still um, recovering from uh, COVID. Um, so, uh, um, uh, yeah, please excuse me if I don't sound great today. Uh, so my team within the Office of Energy and Climate Change is uh, working on, um, actually, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so we're working on several uh, initiatives that were announced under the New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy. Uh, now, this is the New South Wales government's um, plan to transition to a circular economy over the next uh, 20 years. The New South Wales government is, uh, is committed to that. Uh, and uh, it contains a $356 million uh, investment over, uh, over five years. Uh, now, most of my team's time uh, is dedicated to a commitment under the strategy uh, for New South Wales government departments to preference uh, recycled content uh, in their purchasing. Uh, so similar to what uh, Alexis is talking about, uh, was talking about for uh, Victoria, although they're way ahead of us uh, and we're luckily learning from them. Um, however, we're covering uh, all products and departments, um, which is proving rather complex. But today, uh, I want to talk about uh, circular design. Uh, next slide, please. So as someone who doesn't work in the roads uh, industry and works within sustainability, um, most road related sustainability initiatives that I hear about relate um, to using recycled material in roads. So these stories are usually, and we, um, heard, we've heard both of them, uh, heard them today from our other, two, other two speakers, but they're about the success of using uh, household, everyday household and commercial waste. Uh, such as plastic and tires within uh, within roads. Um, so while this can see like can be a seemingly good way of dealing with the waste our society produces, um, having to do this is symptomatic of uh, of the linear economy. These products and materials were never originally intended to end up in a road, um, and it leads to headaches for. Um, local and state authorities and businesses such as close the loop to work out uh, what to do with these wastes. And um, I like what Jody said earlier about uh, um, uh, heroes of the heroes, it's making us heroes of the, the linear economy. Uh, but under a circular economy, uh, sorry, sorry, under a linear economy, we make products uh, for their original use, then we collect them for recycling, and then we work out what to do with them. Uh, but under a circular economy, um, we, uh, we think about the end of life of a material uh, or a product at the design stage. So we're thinking about the entire life cycle of a product at the start. We're also thinking about whether we need that material or asset at all. Um, so in this, uh, uh, figure here on the screen. Um, most of the action uh, that we're all involved in um, from a circular economy uh, waste and recycling perspective hovers around the, the green recycling circle. Uh, but under a circular economy, we should be hovering more around what can we do in the pr production stage um, to, uh, to allow better circularity of materials. Uh, now we've got three um, uh, three key principles uh, for the circular economy that we um, 
uh, that we operate under. Um, so the first one is about designing out waste and pollution. So minimizing the amount of waste we create, maximizing materials efficiency and reducing the harm that can be caused by waste and materials. And then secondarily, keeping products and materials in use. So this ensures that the resources, energy and embodied emissions, sorry, embodied carbon within the product or material are preserved. And then thirdly, um, we're interested in regenerating natural systems. So moving away from um, an economic system which extracts materials from the natural environment to one where nature is regenerated. Next slide, please. And the circular economy is also closely linked to decarbonisation. Uh, strikingly, nearly half of global emissions are associated with the use and management of materials and products. And uh, it's really important to act early in the project life cycle. So uh, this is just a bit of a simple graph here, but it demonstrates the carbon reduction potential um, the carbon reduction potential increases the earlier the intervention, intervention is made in the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about our circular design guidelines. Uh, they're a commitment under our waste strategy and we released them earlier this year. So basically they translate uh, those circular economy principles that I talked about earlier into design strategies, which can be used across all buildings, precincts and infrastructure. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the design strategies. Sorry, there's no pretty pictures on this slide, um, but I'm just going to quickly talk through um, these because I think I'm running out of time rapidly. Uh, so the first principle, and you can see the very high level, so they don't get um, super technical. Um, uh, and so you can really apply them uh, broadly across uh, all different types of infrastructure and buildings. Uh, so design for, designing for longevity. <clears throat> I think you probably do this uh, in the road space already, uh, but this preserves the value of the materials and the embodied carbon, um, reducing the need for new materials. Uh, our second principle is designing for flexibility and adaptability. So this is really balancing the, need, the needs of the present with how those needs might change in the future and designing the ability to, um, to reconfigure should needs change. Uh, our third principle is around designing to maximize material circularity and enabling disassembly. So if you use um, materials, products and connection systems that allow for easy reuse and recycling of materials, um, and then and also designing to allow uh, um, uh, to allow an assembled structure to be more readily easily taken apart. So it can be um, more easily reused without having to demolish, uh, uh, demolish perfectly good assets. Designing for materials efficiency. So materials efficiency means uh, doing more with less. This involves design and construction material, uh, sorry, design and construction methods that use lower amounts of materials and reduce waste. So examples of this could be offsite prefabrication using standard modules and standard sizes. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these. Are uh, reusing uh, existing assets or materials? Again, I suspect this is a, a big one in the road space. And I encourage you to think about what you're already doing uh, in this space and how it could be uh, applied in, in your work. And that's this is incorporating existing structures, products, and materials um, that are already there into the new development. And then we have uh, selecting products with recycled content. So this is often, as I said, where we talk about roads, but you can see it's only one of um, many um, circular economy design principles. I selecting products that are designed uh, for disassembly. So as I said earlier, that uh, the structural product can be readily taken apart without destroying uh, its components. Um, selecting products and materials that have an identified recovery pathway. Um, so this means you're not just leaving um, the thinking about recycling to whoever's going to be dismantling the structure at the end of life, but you're thinking about that from the outset. Selecting low impact materials. <clears throat> so products and materials that 
will have a low impact on the environment and human health. Uh, you don't want to be introducing toxic elements uh, into um, systems that could be dismantled late, later and redistributed through recycling into the community or the environment. Uh, incorporating a green infrastructure is an, an interesting one. Um, uh, so that's about in incorporating the network of green spaces, natural systems, such as waterways, bushland, green walls, et cetera. Um, uh, and I think there's um, a bit of this happening in Sydney in particular at the moment. Um, I can think of uh, the example of uh, West Connects. Um, it's a number of uh, uh, green spaces and parks are being built uh, out of that project. Um, I might just, I think I've run out of time. Um, so I'll just skip over the other two, which are, um, are more procurement focused. Uh, if you can just jump to the last slide. You can have a couple of minutes of like COVID exemption also, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, it's fine, I'll just jump to the last slide. But you can see there's a number of, um, uh, we have 13 high level uh, principles and they really move us away from just thinking about um, recycled content and how we can, um, uh, I think the operational um, waste management is also one we think a lot about uh, into more the space of a design. What can we do from the outset that thinks about the entire life cycle of this um, this asset um, and um, works to reduce uh, the materials, the amount of materials that are used, uh, the waste that is created um, in a way that we can um, uh, preserve uh, our embodied carbon and resources uh, in what we're creating. Uh, and next slide. Uh, so uh, we are now we've released these guidelines, um, we're working to uh, integrate those principles into our government processes, policies and planning systems. Uh, and we're also um, uh, working on a project uh, to quantify the carbon abatement potential uh, of, those, uh, of those strategies. And that's it for me, thanks. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. I am can't tell you how excited I am about these secular <laughs> guidelines, and not just because we're the ones doing the abatement and the carbon <laughs> and it keeps me up at night somewhat. Um, but they really are fantastic guidelines that I think set the bar very high for how we should be looking at changing the system in the future. Um, I really loved hearing how you're learning from Victoria and also taking a different approach at the same time. It's so important that the different states experiment and learn from each other and, and we keep practicing and innovating and, and learning in that way as well. I'll start with one of our questions from the audience, if I may. So it's a question for Alexis, but I think we can all answer it actually. Um, and this is from Sean from Colas. So Sean's asked you, Alexis, what are the key challenges you faced in your journey and how did you resolve them? And I'd love to ask that to Steve and Sarah Rose as well, but Alexis first. I think one of the things that I discovered when early on was all, all roads lead to specifications and everybody was citing to us that the reason why we couldn't do more of this or more of that or, or do something differently is because the specifications were prohibited. And while we have discovered that sometimes that is true, for example, the noise walls that have been talked about, um, often it's not true. Um, and what we did, we spent a lot of time trawling through the specs and creating these guides so that we we're educating our project teams on what was permitted right now. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a two or three fold increase in the volume of recycled materials being used. And we didn't change the rules yet. We just told everybody what they were. So it was just a debunking exercise. So, you know, some of, like I said before, the barriers are often perceived not real. Um, and... You know, another thing that we found was people had had an experience with a product 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. It failed for whatever reason and they've just shut it down, won't entertain the idea of a new sort of emerging product because they think that the recycled materials are inferior. But like, as you heard from Steve, there are actually benefits from some of these things that go above and beyond the virgin equivalent that we should be exploiting um, in some of these materials. 
How about you, Steve? What's been your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Or have you overcome it? Um, yes, uh, yes and yes. The, the microplastics is one, but I'll go, I'll go back to the specs as well. Um, we've seen some very real impacts of specifications that aren't aligned. Um, and it's largely, that they are largely very cleverly used by people who, you know, who don't want change. Um, but there are some very real things like, you know, minimum bitumen content. Uh, these are these are prescriptive specifications and not performance based. But I but I am happy to say that we are transitioning. Um, we are realizing as a society that performance based specs are the way to go if you want to use more recycled content. Um, if I may also mention the second one, the big barrier has been uh, microplastics. There seems to be um, a fervor um, about the potential of microplastics leaching from roads. Well, that would only be the case if roads were used in uh, what some people call road base, uh, plastics used in road base, which is just a nonsense. Uh, that, that is never going to fly. Um, they need to be engineered products that um, become homogenous with the bitumen. So we've done some work with the New South Wales EPA that has proven that the uh, microplastic content of a Reconifelt road with Tonoplast in it is, is actually less than a control road. So that's available to everybody to see. Um, so they're, they're, they're two of the things, Jody. And I also asked Steve, because I believe you're active in almost every state and territory in Australia. How do you go with the challenges between the different states and that lack of harmonisation, which we know we kind of have to deal with, we'd love to solve it, but how do you go with that? Uh, yes, well, it's only Victoria for state roads, which are the more complex engineering projects. Um, and uh, we're active in all other states in local roads. And uh, that, that is uh, often um, the choice of the local council as to the use of kind of place. So we're less encumbered by, by, by that issue in, in council roads, Jody. Fantastic. Sarah Rose, how about you? And pick any of your amazing projects that you're looking at at the moment. What are some of those key challenges and how are you overcoming mm. them? I know your portfolio is quite broad. So. Um, uh, I couldn't even begin to start on all the um, <laughs> challenges associated with uh, recycled content. Um, so I won't start there. Um, but I, I think regarding uh, circular design, um, the challenge wasn't really in creating the guidelines. It's the best ways to um, uh, to get those implemented. Um, they're all very uh, voluntary uh, at the moment. Um, uh, uh, but and we're just starting um, to get into this space. Um, but the I think the the cost of implementing a lot of the circular design strategies can be a consideration because um, uh, say if you um, uh, because it could be mean a higher upfront cost, um, though potentially a lower life cycle cost, um, but you've got a different entity who's often building the asset um, to um, maintaining and bearing all the, the downstream costs. Now, I think in a transport space, um, that's one of the few spaces that you often have the same entity uh, uh, developing and then maintaining um, the asset. Um, uh, so uh, possibly easier to, uh, to implement in that space. Yeah, that notion of split incentives is quite tricky to overcome, isn't it? Um, Steve, we've got one for you that is perhaps a little bit arsy, but I love it. Um, Steve, how can one get their soft plastics to close the loop now? <laughs> well, uh, great question. No, it's asked by someone anonymous. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, well, you can't is the simple answer. Uh, we're not in the uh, in the business of hoarding or stockpiling or, or warehousing soft plastics. But uh, call me in November and uh, the doors will be open again. But I must add that we're not just taking soft plastics for the sake of recycling, uh, you know, being a solution for the linear economy. We're only taking soft plastics from sources that are going to stick with us right through the supply chain to the finished product. Okay, so you're really developing that out, that partnership approach with clients and suppliers. Very much so. One of the problems with the red cycle uh, that the uh, that the people at Red Cycle faced was that there were down uh, there were, Downstream solutions were not developing at the at the rate 
of the collection of this complex material. Uh, we're not going to let that happen at close to Luton. Um, and while we're still on you, Steve, can you just let us know, is Reconifelt with Tonoplast, is that able to be used as wrap at the end of the life? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, anecdotally, uh, the wrap that includes tonoplast or any polymer for that matter um, is of higher value and more desirable than your traditional wrap. What some people don't remember is that polymers have been used to build high quality roads for 50 years and the wrap from those roads is always highly valued, yes. Yeah, that's great. So it is actually designed for the next cycle as well. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, Sarah Rose, in terms of the design for circularity in your design guidelines, so Polly Gole Philippe has asked this, um, can you expand on how you're looking at adopting materials database slash register? Um, I think that's a really tough question. Yeah, so, I mean, uh my team isn't uh isn't currently uh doing that um i know there's um uh there's one or two government departments uh who are um looking at how they can do that uh for their projects um uh but yeah the guidelines are really meant for um uh yeah other entities to work out how you can do it for your projects I'd, I'd love to um, I'd love to uh, have a um, uh, have a, a linked up network of um, of those um, material passports that allow us in the government to do some really good forward planning for for waste management. Um, but that's a bit of a pipe dream in the moment. It is a bit of a pipe dream, and it's been a part dream for the Netherlands too that are that are way in advance of us um, and they've still got multiple schemes developing around materials passports so I think it's something that will continue to kind of in, innovate and develop um, yep. and I think we'll probably have multiple schemes that potentially talk to each other and can transfer data between them if we're lucky um, and that linkage with uh, BIM models and things like that as well will be important with that one. It's just um, a no strong onus to collect uh, on um the owner of the asset to collect and record that data and it is a strong burden. Um, I know that, um, uh, yeah, reporting data is uh, is a massive burden. Um, the, the waste and recycling industry currently mm. has to do that to, to government. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's a struggle at a high level um, apart from um, and you can imagine having to uh, <laughs> report on like down to the, the screws you're using in your assets. So, yeah, it's a really great question. I'd like to finish on a kind of positive note with the questions as well. We talked about challenges, but can, I'd love to hear what has been the most surprising or interesting benefit that you have all seen from circular economy programs or policies. Sometimes it's not um, the obvious ones either. So beyond the, for example, Alexis, beyond the, the 2.5 million tonnes um, that you guys have managed to reuse in your programs, um, what, what's another benefit, a tangible benefit that you've seen for the industry? Um, one of the really nice things for me is the um, the social benefits, the flow on added value. Um, a lot of our, in Victoria, a lot of our recycled material suppliers are also social enterprises supporting either disadvantaged cohorts or, or NDIS supported workplaces or, or other, you know, social enterprises. And I think being able to support um, or create the demand for a product that they're part of the supply chain in, and we've got, you know, places in Hamilton and Ballarat and, you know, they're supplying parts of the, you know, puzzle. Um, the processing is happening somewhere. So we're seeing a lot of uh, regional jobs being created and a lot of social flow on benefits. That was a, um, that wasn't the primary driver for why we started what we're doing, but it's been a really nice kind of additional benefit that it feels good to support. <laughs> How about you, Steve? Oh, similar lines. Um, for me personally, and, and I know our staff in many different uh, locations, it's being able to contribute, to be part of the solution. I mean, we hear a lot of 
doom and gloom um, economically and, uh, you know, uh, high rents and all of these challenges in life. To be able to get up every morning and know that you're part of the solution. I mean, we are consuming at an unsustainable rate. The planet has finite resources. And if, if we at Close the Loop are able to contribute to um, building more resilient roads from waste, um, yeah, we're, that, that contribution is, is undeniable and enormous, Jody. It's a good feeling. Pretty exciting. Sarah so Rose, how about you? Um, so uh, as you would have, as you mentioned earlier, I've been in waste and recycling for like 10 or 11 years. Um, and in, initially the sector was um, uh, very much focused on uh, avoiding um, the issues associated with extraction of uh, natural materials, those environmental issues. Um, but we're definitely moving more into a space of um, uh, demonstrating how the circular economy um, uh, uh, can contribute to our carbon emission uh, goals. And I think that stat that I said earlier around, you know, nearly half of our global emissions that are associated with the use of materials and, and products. So I think for me, it's being able to um, uh, tangib tangibly uh, contribute to our uh, carbon reduction goals. Uh, yeah, through better use of materials and, and management and really thinking through that whole life cycle uh, in a way that um, we're just not used to doing. It's a really exciting, it's a really exciting space. It's a really important message because I think we've moved from a waste management philosophy of what do we do with these plastics, let's put them in the roads, to actually thinking about quality outputs, great social and economic outcomes. But also I, I feel like the dial's really shifted in the past maybe two years on linking up those circular initiatives to carbon um, carbon action as well, that most of our organisations that we're working for have pretty clear goals and objectives around getting to net zero. Uh, and it's really important that we do consider the circular economy as uh, an integral part of that. So thanks to all of our speakers for sharing their work today. For me, today's presentation really highlights the importance of industry and government working together um, to support and develop sustainable circular supply chains for transport infrastructure. Steve can't do it on his own. Alexis can't do it on her own. Sarah Rose can't do it on her own. We really need everyone that's listening in today to bring their piece of the puzzle forward. Um, Ecologic is such a great example and always cited, um, having gotten, again, almost 2.5 million tonnes of recycled materials into Victorian government projects already. And we really look forward to seeing Alexis and all her team in Melbourne for their annual conference from the 18th to 20th to September. Um, and I loved the debunking all roads lead to specification because you managed to get a roads pun in your presentation as well, Alexis. Thank Thank you so much for that. Um, Steve, thanks for showing us the bloody hard work that sits behind your 10 year overnight success um, that has experienced some, some big hits lately as well with um, the issues around the supply chain. And I really liked thinking about the need to build those markets so that you can get local manufacturing happening around Australia. And that's, you know, you're just priming the pump at the moment, right? The, the biggest benefits are yet to come and thinking about the circular agreements that you're piloting with the city of Bendigo, that could be a really interesting future model um, for other local areas around Australia. Um, it's so, I was so delighted that Sarah Rose straight away acknowledged everything that they've learned from the ecologic program in New South Wales. I don't think you often get states taking their hats off to other states in seminars. Um, and it's great that you're taking all those great learnings, but also doing things differently and experimenting in different ways in New South Wales. Um, and please do download those circular design strategy guidelines. They're absolutely excellent and really leading in Australia. So we look forward to that work continuing. So if everyone listening, note that RA now makes their webinar recording available to members who've missed it. So let your member friends know as well, and you can share it with others. Also, in lieu of gifts for our speakers, RA will be donating to a charity aligned with today's theme. So today that will be a charity called Beyond Zero Emissions. It's an internationally recognised think tank that shows through independent research and innovative solutions how Australia can prosper in a zero emissions economy. To inspire political leadership and accelerate policy change, Beyond Zero Emissions publishes research on technological solutions that unlock, the, unlock, unlock this um, massive economic potential for industries 
both regions and communities. Their expert research is the springboard from which they showcase and facilitate lighthouse projects, which spur poly policymakers to scale and replicate successful models. So I'm glad that uh, wine or chocolates are contributing to that far loftier mission than um, weight gain. So thank you to all our speakers again for their time and attendees for coming along to the webinar. It was great to have all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them today. And thank you so much to RA for bringing us all together today. Thanks, Jodie. Bye, everyone.